Hello folks and welcome to our game here on this Monday afternoon. It's not Shane Stavis and joined us ever by Michael Verney. That side of me. How are things, Michael? Good, Shane. Yeah, yeah good. Another another mad weekend. There's so many even go down through the ranks of junior and intermediate games as well, let alone senior games. But uh, just again, I say it again, I keep saying it every Monday and maybe after the weekend's action. The amount of different mad clips and bits and pieces that we see now and different videos that, that come to light. It's great to see it and the club is centre stage at this time of the year and uh, it's only right. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com as always here on a Monday. Use the promo code our game you'll get 15% off. Look at that brilliant selection of jerseys there. There are so many across the different counties up and down the island. So like, have a look there. So there's great stuff. Even stuff like... Uh, a New York jersey as well. And look at that old school one that Michael Verney has on. No, Shane, I'm not being smart. I said it to you off air. I'd gladly wear this pair of dark jeans, maybe. Dark boot cut jeans, maybe. A nice big pair of cowboy boots on a Saturday night. No bother at all. But you see, the the, the boot cut or certainly the uh, the non-tight legged britches are back now. So actually, you were so far out of fashion for a long time, you're actually back in. That's the thing, you should never get rid of anything because it will always come back in at some stage. I also think the word jeans is going to be phased out and the word britches is going to come back into the equation, I think, soon. Yeah, yeah, bridge. A, 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 a nice little britches. Uh, how was your weekend? Were You down, You were down at uh, Ballygunner against Killer One, weren't you? We'll be talking was, more yeah. about it. But, was was yeah. down there yesterday. Yeah, ah, listen, it was, um, it was competitive for stages, but I think, uh, and we're going to get into it a bit later, what, what we all you know, thought might happen, did eventually happen and obviously injuries picked up during the game as well to Darren Morgan and Isla O'Mara. Obviously we're going to totally undermine Kilroan as well. But listen, I'd say, you know, they they did what they could given given the week that was in it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, look, we're going to be talking so much about all the different matches. We're going to have John McIntyre, of course, former Galway manager, Tipperary man, uh, on to talk about the Galway semi-finals over the weekend. We're also going to have Stefano Kunbur on the show a little bit later on. But uh, we just start, want to start off with a little something that I saw in the pub in uh, Burris Lee over the weekend. So I was looking at this uh, image. So this is Aidan Cohen there now, back when he had a bit more hair. Apparently, he's getting an awful lot of slagging in his college group at the moment there. But this is Burris Lee playing in the county under-21 final in the 1990s. And I was saying to the father in the pub, just that, that was a nice jersey. Obviously, it's in black and white. And he goes, well, it's a Temple Derry jersey. So I was just wondering how many examples are there out there of teams having to borrow a local, another local team's jersey to fulfill a fixture? Because Burris Lee and Ballingarry, the co- colours were too close. And just the amount of different answers of, of for example, here, Lockmore Castellani versus Mullen in 2014, Tip ca- County semi final. Eddie Connolly's last game for Lockmore wearing mine Table 2 jerseys. Uh, Turin versus Robert Emmett's in 2019. Their Hurleys and jerseys didn't make it over for London, uh, from London for the game. Right. Four Road from Roscommon loaned them both for the game. There's just so many examples, some brilliant uh, replies, even from clubs across the country. Bally Giblin saying, We wore the, the CBS. Uh, who's a CBS Mitchellstown's jerseys for the Junior A County Final last year. Most of the players went through there, so they were familiar with the jerseys. So there's so many examples of that. Keep your comments coming in and let us know what comes to mind for you. Yeah, see, it's okay when you're familiar with them, but a lot of time it's a, a neighbouring club and like your neighbours, obviously, but you're generally like rival clubs as well. So there's been a couple of nights, even when, I remember when we were in Offaly, might play somebody, I don't know why, even during, no, I'll tell you what, it was during internal games that you might, you know, you mightn't wear the Offaly jerseys, you might wear two sets of club jerseys. So you could end up wearing, you know, a club jersey that maybe you don't particularly like, even though you don't really like many of them, apart from your own. And, like, there's definitely still pictures going around WhatsApp groups thrown out every six months or every year of someone wearing a club jersey that they wouldn't, wouldn't be caught dead wearing normally, but that they had to wear on this night. Yeah, and Derek Lynch, a clear man, of course, is saying that jersey will burn the crest to your, uh, the crest to your chest, saying, welcome to the bright side. Obviously, a clear man there, and he's enjoying the fact that I'm wearing the uh, the saffron and, and uh, gold. Or is it saffron and blue? Saffron and blue. Uh, Emerald 90, if the Galway Club uh, Hurling Championship ever gets put into Leinster, what would happen to the All-Ireland Club semi-finals? Well, I mean, I do watch it, and I think I'd love to see Bally Hale against both um, Bally Gunner and Napiershik this year, but obviously only one of them, they can only meet one of them. In some way, obviously, this wouldn't be allowed for because of the calendar being too tight. But can you imagine if it was like, let's say, six, make it handy, 16 county champions come out and they're in four groups of four for club hurling? Like, there's some brilliant fixtures there, the fixtures there that we're never going to see. Well, I put it to you this way, Shane. I, we're what, we're about 13 days out from the Pearshig and Bally Gunner, and I am looking forward to that game as much as I've looked forward to any county game in the last couple of years. 
Uh, I, I, it's going to be so hard to call. There's obviously the history between the two of them. Bally Gunner were, would have lost, I think, three finals in a row had they not beaten the Pearshik in, was it 2018? Um, like that, I'm looking forward to that as much as I look forward to Bally Gunner and Bally Hale earlier on this year. Like They are the big marquee games that we love to see. Uh, it's great to see it at that stage in one sense, and then in another sense, that's one team that... You know, it's probably in the top three, four in the country that's going to be gone at that stage. But that's that's the nature of it. If it was, you know, if it was ever possible that there was some sort of Champions League style uh, on the club championship, it would be unbelievable with all the county champions going in. Imagine, uh, you know, you see that, you remember that Super League uh, proposal that came up, um, I don't know, was it a year or two years ago, where a lot of the big European clubs were going to break away and make their own kind of European league, like, Imagine if like clubs went rogue or something within the GA and all you know the real big kind of super clubs. It's obviously never going to happen, thankfully. But um, they are games that you would pay to watch every weekend. The likes of Bally Hale, Thomas's Bally Gunner, and the Pearson, and these teams kind of uh, going up against each other every weekend. Yeah, like the old European uh, Cup format says, uh, Aerog ninety or sorry, Emerald ninety. He's obviously talking about a thirty-two county open draw. Emerald eighty nine says Ballinasloe won the twenty thirteen All Ireland Junior uh, final wearing Nafina from Dublin jerseys because they forgot their jerseys. Ah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, We're I remember that. Final. Yeah, yeah, but for uh, in terms of the celebrations and the cup presentation and the photos and all that, I think they did have the jerseys brought in at that stage. So somebody obviously got them and brought them up, but they had been forgotten. Uh, Richard Hogan, could Napierschik versus Ballygunner be under Saturday night lights? Like that's a game I'm definitely going to. That's a done on down the Gaelic grounds. That's yeah, an unmitigated. It's funny, Shane, it. actually, because that that pitch was only relayed, and I know it's. I don't know how common it is, and some of the Limerick folk might tell us. But the Limerick football final was played in Kilmallock yesterday, which I just thought was somewhat interesting. Um, is, is it like it's not to say that it's only her and only at the moment, but I was wondering for some of James uh, Daly or a few of her Limerick. Uh, followers like to flash might tell us how common of an occurrence is it for a Limerick football final to be played in Kilmallock but obviously the hurling is going to be there next weekend I'd imagine it would be the Sunday because to me that's the marquee fixture of the weekend and that gets prime time on Sunday uh, and that listen that's the game that's the game everybody's going to want to be at uh, on Sunday week yeah and I'd imagine generally TG Carter get first pick so that would be a Sunday game for them you'd imagine that they would be going for that game that weekend uh let's see john collins says the big games are great but the local rivalries are impossible to beat yeah that is also true um the only the thing Michael about Ryan... that is is that is that when these when these teams play each other regularly enough like bally like uh like bally gunner and the piercing it might not be like what say a local rivalry but it's definitely a rivalry do you know what i mean and yeah. i know bally gunner haven't played uh uh the shamrocks valley hail that much but there's definitely a rivalry there. It's two big teams. They're, you know, they've played twice. It's 1-1 at the moment. And hopefully the next time they meet, it'll be a big deciding game. But there, it is hard beat. The local, local is local. They're the people you see every day. They're the people you run into. They're the people that you're avoiding for six months of the year if they beat you in a knockout fixture to knock you out or whatever. That's local is local in that kind of respect. But there's definitely still big rivalries between some of those big clubs. Like, does it, like just say with Thomas's and Bally Hale, like there's a big rivalry there now because Thomas's were hammered in the, the final a couple of years ago and were it was heartbreak at the end of last year's All Ireland semi final. So they're mad to get a crack at them again. So it, lo local rivalry is probably the biggest and most bitter, shall we say? But there's still big rivalries outside of counties and outside of provinces even. Yeah. So here's a picture of Michael Ryan holding the Michael Ryan Cup after Belly McCarberry ended a 22 year wait for Munster Glory. A, a gas one. Like obviously. You know, it's so unusual to have a cup uh, named after somebody who's still alive. I mean, I'm sure it has happened before. And he had three daughters playing and he was doing co-commentary on WLR <laughs> FM. I mean, what a day for uh, Michael Ryan. He was commentating on, you know, Michael Ryan commentating on the Michael Ryan Cup final match. It's mad with his with three daughters playing. We would have had an interest in one this year, Shane. It didn't come to fruition, unfortunately. But the, the Senior B Championship at Offaly was only resurrected uh, probably about two to three years ago. And the Senior B Trophy is called the Mick Verney Cup, after my granduncle Mick, who would have been a great servant of uh, Offaly GM, and was a treasurer in Burr and Offaly for years. So we were beaten in the semi-final this year, and I had it in the back of my head all along. Wouldn't it have been unreal for Mick Verney to play in for the Mick Verney Cup? Like, it would have been unreal. Hopefully it'll happen again if I'm not regraded back to Junior B or something. <laughs> but uh, hopefully it might get a chance to happen again at some stage, but it's a bit of a mad one. Yeah, so um, then as well as true Gales and Monaghan, Monaghan footballer Gary Moan, what he did over the weekend was uh, was brilliant as well. He's got that brilliant mohawk. 
but he shaved it off. I'll get a picture of it up here in a second, but um, fair play to him because I know at the end of the day, it's only hair and grow back and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's still a fair thing that if, if you've been going around with this mohawk for a while and it's looking well, it's looking well, to then, you know, it's transformative really, isn't it? Yeah, I, it, it's a, it's a fair thing to do now. In fairness, because he obviously loves he obviously loves his mop uh, and with that mullet and everything, it's going to the modern age kind of haircuts. But it's gas. We did a shave or die. I could be ten or fifteen years ago now, and my head looks like doesn't look great bald, and you know not too many or people do look do look well or with hair. Yeah, but one of the lads got it done. He won't thank me for saying it. Paddy Ryan got it done, and he, he looked like Kane, the wrestler. And it just, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't good now. And I don't think he's ever shaved his head since for charity or otherwise. Mm. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about uh, mistakes over the weekend and obviously what happened between Nace and Crokes. We'll bring that up a little bit later. But you found a, another place where there was um, a fair few mistakes in a match program over the weekend. But uh, I just, uh, yeah. I just thought this this was an interesting one. I, I've ne I've never seen the like of this before. So it was in the uh, the Leitrim Junior Football Final. So Carrie Gallen uh, were crowned Leitrim Junior Football Championships. The beat our champions beat St Mary's uh, Kiltort one eleven to one eight. Colum Kiernan got a late goal uh, as the blue and whites came home, came from two points down to snatch victory. But their late uh, kind of comeback wasn't the only talking point. So the match program and this is this is gas. I, I never I've never seen like this before. So the match program uh, featured several numbers. If you look particularly down the bottom end, it might be a bit hard to see, but uh, it's supposed to say jersey missing. Now missing is misspelled as well. So one of many maybe mistakes that happened over the weekend. But jersey mising all the the big sign of subs numbers. I don't know if there was lads trying to be cute and maybe pill for a jersey or something like that. I'm not sure, but. Uh, uh, they obviously had a bit of a joke with it and put it down in the program, <laughs> so they had a bit of a crack with it, crack with it anyway. But it's fair to say, after winning the county final at the weekend, the chances of more jerseys being missing are greatly, uh, greatly increased. I'd say. Yeah, yeah. Okay, delighted to say that we have John McIntyre joining us on the on the line. John, how are things with you? Hi, Shani. Well, not too bad. Not too bad. You were at the Galway semi-finals over the weekend. Can you talk to us about uh, Thomas's beating Sarsfields two nineteen to fifteen? And uh, Lock Ray seeing out, uh, seeing it out against Clarence Bridge, 313, 16 points. Yeah, that's right, Shane. Prior to yesterday's semi finals in Pierce Stadium, there was, a, I suppose, an opinion that Sarsfields had the capacity to really put it up to the tight quarters. They had been involved in arguably the match of the championship in the opening round last July. And, um, you know, Sarsfields, you know, they had a few county players in Joseph Cooney, Darren Morrissey, Kevin Cooney's on the Galway squad. And they have a good pedigree uh, when they get to the business end of the championship. Uh, but really, the, the first half performance wasn't good enough to, to get them over the line. They had a very strong win in Pierce Stadium, typical of the venue. Uh, they only led by three points at half time. They did score seven points on answer to go five points up after about 20, 22 minutes. And your centres have got it. If they add three or four more, they're really going to ask serious questions of St. Thomas's. But the champions outscored them by five points to three in the remaining first half action. Only three down at half time. And you kind of knew the writing was on the wall for Sarsfields there and then. And in fairness to St. Thomas's, they upped the ante again in the second half. They restricted Sarsfields to three points. Only one of them came from play. And, you know, I kind of said it in my match report this morning. Despite the fact they've been so long at the top, you could argue that Thomas's are actually getting better. Really, and, and like I looked at some of the highlights and I saw in the first half, Kevin Cooney had a very good goal chance, flashed it over the bar. Do you think that That's that right, was yeah. decisive? It was a key moment because, as we all know, goals in matches are critical. And that might have shaken St. Thomas's a little bit and given a little bit of extra momentum to Sarsfields. Um, look at Darren Morrissey had his struggles with, with Aina Burke. He was isolated in the full back line in the first half. Uh, Connor Cooney was roving away from Joseph Cooney. And it's, look, at I played centre back all my life, and it's the classic problem for somebody wearing the number six jersey. Do you stick or do you travel? And Joseph more or less held his, held his position. Connor Cooney was roving all over the field. Look, at I, I've been saying it for years, Conor Cooney, whatever people think about him at inter-county level, he is a star performer uh, in the Galway Championship year in, year out. Uh, he scored five points in play yesterday. The Burke brothers were in, 
great form as well. Ushin Flannery picked off three points in play. A young fellow, Victor Manso, came on. James Regan had just got injured. First touch, you got hit the ball stuck in the Sarsfields net. And I thought it was a, an exhibition of ruthless efficiency from St. Thomas's. I was at the All-Ireland Club semi-final, uh, I think it was last January or early February in Charles when they did everything bar beat Bally Hale, two brilliant TJ, um, TJ goal, TJ Reid goals, you know, pulled the rug from under their feet. There was utter devastation in their camp. You see, one of the things that people are beating them or beating them with a stick here in Galway is that even though they've won four county championships in a row, something which the great Sarsfields, Alton Roy and Portumna teams weren't able to do, the record at All-Ireland level isn't as good. They have the lone All-Ireland title and that came the very first year they won the championship and they're desperate to get back and have another crack at the Tommy Moore Cup. That's partly, John, just to do with the outrageous standard at national level at the moment as well. They're coming up against the Bally Hale side that could go down as the greatest club team of all time. Bally Gunner are on the road now and could win a couple of All-Irelands as well and even the Pearshig around as well. So they're, they're, they're victims of the standard around them really more than anything else. I would agree completely, Michael. Um, I think the All-Ireland club hurling title is harder one now than maybe even 10 years ago. Uh, I mean, what Bally Gunner did to Killer One yesterday was astonishing. Look at, I know Killer One it was her first county title since the mid eighties. They're entitled to celebrate it, but they're a, they're a club of, of you know, intrinsic pride. You know, they they wouldn't have liked to have gone down to watch Park yesterday, regardless of the timing of the fixture or not having much time to celebrate getting back to the top of the Berry Club hurling. But to be beaten by seventeen or eighteen points will have hurt them badly, even though they have the big consolation of being top dogs again in Tipperary. And as you say, and then Piercy are an exceptional team as well. That's going to be some match with them and, and, and Bally Gunner. And of course, then you have the great Bally Hale team in, in, in Leinster. So um, Thomas's timing isn't great, but they are now on the cusp of, of doing what only two ever Galway teams have done before. Castlegar from 1936 to 1940 and Turlock Moore, they did the six in a row, but from 1960 to 66, they, 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 they did the five in a row as well. So this is where St. Thomas is at. And we all hear about the competitiveness of, of the Galway Club Championship, and especially in with so many good teams around. For St. Thomas's to be in their seventh final in 11 years, going for the five in a row, it's remarkable consistency by any standards. How, has the team changed much this year, even in terms of setup? So, like Shane Cooney wasn't available last year after doing his cruciate. He's back, uh, you know, uh, mm. taking full part now. Davy Burke seemed to be kind of sitting from centre back and directing traffic last year. So, is it different? Is it much different this year? Not a lot. Um, Shane Cooney, as you've said, uh, Shane has been out uh, since he did his uh, cruciate earlier in the year. He came on in the second half yesterday. And I expect him to probably start number six in the county final on Sunday week. I mean, remember, he was centre back in the Galway team prior to his injury. And his return is only going to strengthen St. Thomas's. David Burke yesterday is the commander in chief. He was marshalling the team as he's been doing for years. He was sitting in that deep line role. Um, you know, cut out, cut out a lot of Sarsfield's attacks and then popped up at the other end of the field to pick off two valuable second half points. And of course, his brothers Cahal and you have Aina and you have Dara, who are still going as strong as ever. And this Victor Manso, who came on yesterday, I've seen him a couple of times now. He's got great pace. So he's added something to the team as well. And they are hell-bent on, on doing this five in a row. But I think that's only part of their mission. They want to get back to an All-Ireland Club semi-final and, and to prove themselves at the highest level. John, mm. just on, on their final opponents, and I know maybe Thomas, mm. uh, they won't be looking at... Uh, be looking past Loch Ray anyway just based on Loch Ray have been brilliant this year they're unbeaten the whole way through the championship mm. maybe a lot less heralded players but they're like they've been building the last couple of years and they look like they're ready for they'll be ready for a county final after per, their performance at the weekend I've no doubt about that uh, Mike I hadn't seen Loch Ray for a couple of years until yesterday and I was very impressed uh, to have a high profile management team over them Greg Kennedy the former Galway and Dublin selector is among them, Gavin Keary, uh, who was involved with minor teams here as well over the years, uh, is also on the sideline. And, um, you know, uh, you have Shane Cusick there as well. I mean, Gavin Keary was involved with Clare, 
memory serves me right. So they're throwing everything at this lock, uh, lock ray. Last year, they were knocked out of the championship by Clarenbridge. They turned the table yesterday and turned it quite emphatically. I mean, Clarenbridge's over-dependence on Evan Nyland was startling for a team that's supposed to have a lot of promising young talent. So it was a step backwards for Clarenbridge. The young team maybe got to the county final ahead of their time last year, but there was an expectancy this year that they would build on that progress and, and probably get back to the county final. But you know, if you took Nyland out of their team yesterday, they were well beaten. And as it was, they, they came up short by six points. Lock Ray have a lot of talented players in the ranks. Shane Morgan was outstanding at cornerback until his hamstring injury, how bad it is. He would be an incalculable loss to them for ahead of the county final. Johnny Cohen does that David Burke job for Lock Ray, very experienced. Um, and they have a very even team. And, to beat St. Thomas's, you need quality forwards. And Lockray have that. Uh, uh, Mark McMahon scored two goals and two points yesterday. Dylan Shocknessy is a nice forward. So is Anthony Burns. And the speed of Jamie Ryan. He didn't get a score for, for Lockray yesterday, but he's run through the heart of the Clarence Bridge defence caused, caused untold damage. damage. They have a reliable free taker in Neil Keary. I don't think they'll be overawed by the occasion. They've been building for a few years. It's actually repeated the first final that St. Thomas has won back in 2012. Lock Ray haven't been back there since. And they're a completely different team that, that in, in terms of you know physical attributes compared to their, those epic and controversial clashes with Perdona back in the day. So they're, they're pleasing on the eye. They've good forwards, and I think it's good for the Galway final, and it's good for St. Thomas's that they're coming up at, against a new team uh, in in Sunday in Sunday Sunday week showdown. Were you there? Um, were you at that match in 2012 when I suppose Johnny Maher laid waste to the St. Thomas's team on a fairly dirty day? Yeah, well, I was, and um, look at he's he's a he's he's a hard man. And uh, he, he wouldn't back away from anything. Um, you know, he, he, he was a one-man juggernaut at times in terms of physique. And, um, you know, he, he, he lived at the edge. There's, there's no doubt about that. And I'd, say I suppose, he lived, I'd say he lived the other side of the edge, John, a lot of time, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying to be diplomatic, fellas, here. You know? But uh, I suppose you go back to the Portumna game, the incident, the county final with Joe Canning and the alleged stamping and that. Lock Ray didn't have a didn't get a great press that time, and I think part of it was was undeserved. But having said that, now they're back in the big time with a new team, new style of hurling, moving the ball at pace, mobile about the field, good stickmen. And um, they they will serve it up to St. Thomas's now. St. Thomas's would want to sleepwalk their way into this county final, not that they will, because they've just so much experience. And I think the one thing I like about St. they have this almost automatic telepathy on the field. Players know what what where players are. They're very cohesive. Uh, they're great at picking out the loose man. And now James Regan's injury, he looked in big trouble, similar to Shane Morgan coming off the field yesterday with a hamstring. But St. Thomas has had more than the 15 starters, despite what most people think. And they're, they're going to be a tough nut to crack for Loch Ray in the final. John, can I just fire this comment at you here just from one of our viewers, ML89, he just says, the current Thomas's team will probably beat the 28, 2018 Thomas's team by 7, 8 points. Agree that they've improved some amount. Game against Ballyhale proved that. They have their eyes on Ballyhale again. Do you think this is the best version of Thomas's at the moment? Well, I thought their best ever performance was against Ballyhale in Turles last spring. And they agonisingly came up short. And then when they lost to Turlock Moore heavily in the group champ in the group stages of this year's championship, there was a kind of a perception out there. God, they've, they've been they've been hit under the waterline. They're in trouble. They've been a long time around. It'll it'll test them to bounce back. But they have bounced back in spectacular fashion. I think this is the best version of the St. Thomas's team. Uh, I would I would agree with that caller. This this they're they are a serious outfit now. And I think they have it every way. And they're, they're as hungry as ever. I mean, they're tackling on the field yesterday. The turnovers, the forced. Um, Sarsfields will wake up this morning thinking an opportunity passed them by. But I'm not so sure. I just don't think they were, they were, they were good enough uh, to, to, to 
get the job done against St. Thomas. They came up against a superior force on the day. And there was a reason why they only scored three points in the second half, because St. Thomas has largely dominated the concluding 30 minutes. Can I ask you about the um, Henry Shefflin, what he might have seen from the club championship? Like, have players, to your mind, probably stepped up for him and, and you know, might put themselves in the conversation for next year? Well, I've been sort of pushing Jamie Ryan's case in of Loch Ray for, for, for a couple of years now. I think he's one guy to have to look at. That Mark McManus up in the Loch Ray forward line yesterday certainly caught my eye. Like all teams, uh, Shane, managers need to find one or two players nearly every year that's not alone going to make the squad but be pushing hard for first team places. And I think Galway... They have a lot of players there still from 2017. There's a few back from back 2012, 2013. And I think having been there for year one now, Henry knows a lot more about the existing players in the squad. He would, he, they would have thrown their eye over, you know, the, the, the talent that's coming through in the county. There's a lot of young players out there. Um, who, who are putting their hands up to be called up to the Galway squad. Whether they're good enough to survive the cut and trust at the highest level of hurling, uh, nobody knows. But certainly if Henry goes back to the well with the same group of players that he did in 2022, Galway will not win this year's odd Ireland. Mm. Michael? Yeah, just a comment in there from one of our viewers, uh, John Maher. Great to hear John McIntyre, great journalist and manager. Was very unlucky when manager of Offaly. Good on him, great show, and many thanks. One of the reasons John was unlucky with Offaly is because he actually gave me my start back in 2007, which is something he probably since regrets. I don't, Michael, even though you weren't a great corner. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is coming out anyway, in fairness. There's no diplomacy here now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, in fairness, Michael, you were you didn't get called up for nothing, you know. <laughs> Um, John, we, I might as well ask you a bit about Killer One and their run this year as well. Mm -hmm. so the parish is probably only 20 minutes out the road from you there from, from your home yeah. parish in Blora. Can you talk to us about why you think that they were beaten so decisively about Bally Gunner? Is it, you know, do we have to allow for the fact that they were carrying injuries, like their 3, 6 and 14 were carrying injuries? Obviously, Aaron Morgan had to go off injured early in the game. Craig Morgan wasn't available at all. They're playing their third week in a row. You know, it's just too many factors and then come up against the best team in the country. Yeah, I mean, I would endorse everything you said there, Shane. I mean, at face value, it looks an awful result for Killer One McDonald's. But then when you drill down and look at the injuries, the fact that it came just seven days after getting back to the top of Tipperary Club hurling since the mid-80s and coming up against a Bally Gunner team who, who's, I believe, their level of professionalism in terms of their preparation would do justice to a county team. When I was over Clarem Bridge back in 2001, we came up against Barry Gunner in the All Ireland Club semi final in Turles. And, you know, at that stage, they were still finding their feet in Waterford and they've just gone on to dominate the Waterford Championship uh, since. They're a well oiled and slick machine. They're backbone by a lot of county players. They were playing in their own backyard. So there was a lot of factors against Killer One McDonough's. As a tip man, you're kind of hoping, like I'm kind of worried about Tipperary in the short term. I mean, obviously Dylan Quirk's bereavement was was horrific, especially for his family. And leaving, you know, just putting on my hurling hat, that's a big blow for Tipperary hurling going forward. The manner in which Colin Bonner was removed from his position has not sat well with an awful lot of temporary supporters. It could and should have been better handled. So I think there's legacy issues from that. Liam Cahill and Michael Beavens are going to have their hands full. They will bring a lot of organisation structure and professionalism to temporary position. But have temporary got the quality of players to compete? Not so much with the likes of, of Cork and Clare, but Limerick. Uh, they are they are the top dogs by some distance at the moment, and um, from that in that context, I would like to have seen Kerwin McDonough's being more competitive yesterday because they are the best team in Tipperary and have proven why they are. And even allowing for all the allowances, as you said, Shane, it was still kind of a sobering day for Tipperary hurling. 
just on that, John, as well, um, Cahill and Beavens are kind of starting behind the eight ball, aren't they, with a lot of big absences even for next year. Obviously, you mentioned, you know, the sad circumstances, obviously, around Dylan Quirk. Mm-hmm. Barry Heffernan's cruciate. Craig Morgan's cruciate. They're yeah. three of your best defenders from last year. You know, and it, like it's a difficult position to be starting off. Now, I know they won't make excuses because they didn't make any excuses in Waterford and they just plowed on with whoever was missing. Or they just plowed on without them. But it is a difficult spot to start. It is, Mike, and on top of that, then uh, Parik Maher is gone. I know he was gone last year, and Brendan Maher is gone, and uh, John McGrath is injured as well. So, look at put it this way: I prefer Liam Cahill as manager of the Tipperary hurling team next year than John McIntyre, to be honest, because I think they have their work really cut out. But the only thing, the only advantage is, and it is an advantage, and I, I think people underestimate it. The expectations aren't great locally behind Tipperary next year for all the factors that we've spoken about. So it's a kind of a free shot in a way for Liam Cahill and Michael B, but kind of maybe results aren't going to be the be all and end all in 2023. But at least if they're knitting together a team that will hold its own in, in the subsequent years, will be, I think that will be their main agenda. But of course, we, we, we hope things will work out better for Tipperary. Uh, they had a difficult summer uh, this year. And um, as I said, the, the fallout then from Colin Bonner's departure, um, I, I just think that this year might be great. Hmm. Michael, anything else before we uh, let John go? No, I'm sure John has a lot of deadlines that he needs to meet over, over the next probably 24 hours. So thanks a million, John. That was that was great. And uh, we, we might get you on again to chat about the, the final or the, the aftermath of the final, an intriguing final ahead in Galway. I know you're dead right, Mike. Because I'm after spending the last 20 minutes talking to you, Bucks, I'm now under really serious pressure. I so thought as going, much. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to end this phone call immediately. Good luck, lads. Thanks a million, John. Thanks very much, Take John. Care, Talk to you soon. Take care. Ah, uh, brilliant to have John McIntyre on, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it's funny. Um, when he came back to Offaly in 07, I was one of the ones that were were called in, and he dropped a load of other lads. And I remember, I'll never forget the headline in the local paper was "Mac the Knife." And before, when he came back, then it was "Return of the Mac." They just saw his uh his name does lend itself to a lot of famous songs or famous sayings down through the years. But uh, yeah, he's a real uh, a real passionate hurler man, big horse man as well, and. Uh, Obviously busy there with uh, trying to get the the, Con- the Connacht Telegraph off for the for the week ahead. Do you know? Um, just in terms of the, the teams wearing other uh, other teams' jerseys, Six Mile Bridge just replied to me there saying the Bridge wore the Limerick Prison jerseys in the 2016 Junior C final. Now that's pretty yeah, slick. It? It's just a it's a link. Um, it's a link with someone. Usually it's a teacher. Um, so you might end up wearing school jerseys or something like that. But it's a link with someone. Would you be able to get these? Or you, is there any way we can get another set of jerseys? Um, and Adrian McGrath just has a comment in here. Biggest advantage for Tip uh, being uh, everyone thinks they're rubbish is isn't exactly a thrilling forecast for the season ahead. No, listen, it's got the expectations definitely are low before the season starts. But like I think Liam Cattle will thrive on that. I have to say, like as I said, they are behind the eight ball. But I think uh, I think he'll love that position. He what he definitely won't look at it like he's not going to list out. He ne- has never listed out the problems he has. He'll just work with what he has. But uh, definitely does look there. A few disadvantages, shall we say, going into 2023. Yeah, I'm not interested uh, in excuses. Uh, as in, from my point of view, I still t- think Tipperary always have hurlers. So, in terms of being, comp- I don't think Tipperary are going to go and beat Limerick next year, but being very competitive against absolutely everyone else. And I know there's all the injuries and all that kind of stuff, which will certainly hamper the team. I still think Tipperary will be very competitive and uh, start the upward trajectory that might take a couple of years. We should uh, we should talk a little bit more about how good Bally Gunner are. Like Kevin Mahoney with 2 2. Patrick Fitzgerald, is he the one of the best looking uh, 18 year olds in the country? And I mean that as a hurler, obviously, not his looks. Uh, Park Matt, he scored six. Harry Rudd, look again, he likes a goal. He came on and scored a goal. Desi Hutchinson with three and a couple of other scores from other players. Willie Cleary scored five points for um, for Killer One. Keen Darcy with three. Jerome Cal with two. And Nilo Mara to go off injured. He was one of four players to also add a point as well. But uh, that goal from Kevin Mahoney where he was bundled over and he was on his knees and he still buried into the back of the net. That was that was quite a class finish there. But um, Do you know what I liked so... even more about it, Shane, even than the finish, is um, the ball went down uh, kind of into the corner between him and I'm not sure if it was a fullback or, or Kieran Cahill. 
and he actually just let the ball beat him. Uh, and it was brilliant because the defender had kind of sold himself. You know, everybody always goes for the touch. You go for the touch, but you actually sense that the defender was probably, you know, very close behind him, let the ball beat him, came in, fell and lost balance, obviously. I saw some people saying that, you know, I think that he touched the ball off the ground. I didn't think it was that obvious. He didn't, like, rub the ball across the ground or anything like that. He just kind of fell to the ground, came back up and, and stitched it. Um, and listen, there's probably a couple of things to this game. Killer One uh, needed to start well, and it didn't start badly. But that brilliant hook that, that Philip Mahoney got on Willie Cleary in the fourth minute, uh, like I put it to you this way, there's a weird thing with Bally Gunner. Um, I think that a penalty save, or, this, or Stephen O'Keefe saved the penalty. I'm not sure who it was against earlier on this year. I think it could have been against De La Salle in the opening minute, and Bally Gunner scored like the next 110 or something like that. So Philip Matney got the hook uh, on, on Willie Cleary, and Bally Gunner went and got the next four points, three in a row from Desi. Uh, it's just like they, they take any little. Uh, any little momentum shift, they take it and maximise it. And uh, they, they had their own goal chance. I think Kevin Matney actually uh, saw a shot save from Paddy Williams in the 19th minute. But they fired ahead. And in fairness, Killer One, they kept hanging on their coattails, got back to 11 7. And it's just like some teams are just like perfect with their timing. And that goal from Patrick Fitzgerald before the break, the timing couldn't have been any better for Bally Gunner and it couldn't have been any worse for Killer One. Because if they went in four down, you know. You'd be trying to keep, and I, I know this sounds, you know, it might sound a bit mad, but you'd be trying to keep it below 10. Their legs were always going to fail. Aaron Morgan was gone off. Niall Amara was struggling. Now, in fairness, before that, I thought Niall Amara was brilliant and was firing himself in everywhere and was getting on the ball as much as he could. But all of a sudden, from 11 points to 7 in the 32nd minute of injury time to the 32nd minute in the second half, it was 2.12 to 7 points and it's, and it's game over. So, like, that little patch before the break and after the break, they absolutely went to town. And good sides do that. Good sides sense an opportunity and they go for the throat. And it's funny with Bally Gunner, you can see, even when the ball could be 70 yards out, you can see nearly that there's a goal chance on here. And it's like that they know as well. They know that maybe bodies have been, have been, um, have gone forward on the opposition team and they sense it and they take it on and try and create that goal chance. And they ended up before yesterday. Yeah, and Niall O'Mara getting the hamstring injury or worsening the hamstring injury that he already had was a bit of a disaster. Aaron Morgan, I believe, his hand, like he was, um, the Killer One lads came back via Burris Lee last night, so they actually happened to come into the pub where I was in, in, in Joe's, and I think Aaron Morgan had some sort of a bandage on his hand or maybe even a cast, but one of them was saying that he had a split down his hand and everything, so that's why he had to... He had a broken finger off. coming into it, uh, Shane, anyway. He had a broken finger playing the last four games, I believe. Uh, yeah. So... You know, that's like, he, it was probably like a, another, and uh, probably, I don't know if he broke it. Liam O'Kelly seemed to think he might have broken two fingers after the game yesterday. But uh, he's obviously been one of their best defenders as well. So that's just yet another blow that they that they had to deal with. We'll, we'll come yeah. to, we'll come into detail on that game a little bit more because I believe we have a, another, another special guest ready to go. Yeah, we're joined by Stefan O'Kunbor here. Uh, Stefan, how are things with you? Yeah, not too bad. Can't complain. Good. So you're you're here. You're taking part in the plant for the Planet Games later this month in Kenya. So the games are the brain, brainchild of Warriors for Humanity founder and former Galway Jewel player Alan Kearns, and it'll feature fifty male and female intercounty Gaelic players from across all four codes. The aim is to highlight the impact of climate change and raise sufficient funds to plant one million trees in Africa. So just to even ask you about that. Talk to us about you know th this whole thing and and Kenya and and what it's going to be like. Um. I really, yeah, look, it's it's huge. I've I've never been part of something like this before. Um, like my my father is extremely excited. Um, for me to get out, get over there, it's it's going to be, yeah, new for for Ireland, get get as a as a whole. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting out there in two weeks. Mm. Would and climate change be something that you're uh, that you're strong on, or is there a bit of a? Uh, not don't mean this in a bad way. Is there a bit of a Greta Thunberg in you? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, lads. Um, yeah, I guess just to, I guess to some degree, yeah, it's definitely a conversation that's been brought um, amongst my mates and I, um, far more now more more so than in the past. Um, and I guess more, the majority of people my age would would feel fairly strong towards towards climate change. So mm. yeah, there's a, there's a kind of a thought chain. I know that people, I know Christy Moore actually wrote a song about it that where you know the action our actions of this current generation are massively they're massively affecting us but they're massively going to affect the next generation as well and you just thought i was over in paris there last weekend it was 21 degrees at the end of october 
and you're wearing a t-shirt around during the day and you're just thinking there's something wrong here and there's a lot of kind of <laughs> weird, weird things going on but it's going to be definitely going to be a great experience for you without a doubt yeah it, yeah it should be eye-opening um a whole new perspective um and being in a position to to be an ambassador for such a great cause is is massive yeah it's huge and you excited about actually just going to kenya and seeing what the place is like and um I don't know, it's a place famous for like middle distance and long distance runners and all that kind of stuff. What, what would you know about the place? I wouldn't know too much outside of that. Myself. Yeah, like I'm, I'm pretty keen to see how like how they tackle like their culture. Um, I've been to Nigeria a few times, um, maybe four months in total. So I've seen I've seen the African kind of side of life, um, but not not so much not so much Kenya. But I guess yeah, that it's another like seeing the Kenyan athletes and running with them and stuff um, will be a, a cool aspect of the whole trip. But the main goal is to bring bring light to climate change. So, can we talk about your year uh, playing football? At the start of the year, obviously, you were on that run with the club, and then you ended up in an All Ireland club semi final against Steelstown. And I think it was your shoulder you hurt that day, and the the game was stopped up for for twenty minutes. Like, how serious was it, and what's your recollection of that uh, that afternoon? I was probably a bit, was probably a bit naive in terms of how I viewed shoulder injuries. Um, I thought you just pop it back in and play. Um, but there's all this insurance cracks and no one really wanted to pop it back in. They, they kept me there in the field for 20 minutes. Um, it probably looked worse than, than what it was, I guess. I was able to rehab it for the next nine weeks, get back to playing. Not not fully confident in my body still because it, it was niggling me all year um, and then holding off surgery till the, the very end of the season. So I guess, yeah, it was a lot of ups and downs. It came at a very unfortunate time, the very start of the season, so I missed all the preseason um league and that's the yeah, the last thing i needed as well trying to tr transition back from nfl to, to get like and, and how did it happen i went for a diving block um and i just landed really awkwardly and twisted into my shoulder and just popped it popped it out of place really badly yeah how painful was it yeah look by far by far the worst pain i've i've endured in ways in term across my football. right yeah and how long did it take you before you could get back and play properly probably the bones of two and a half months never fully got the strength back back into it um i was able to kind of strap it up and kind of like plod away over the course of the year but um hopefully now come january after surgery i should i should be back to full strength so since coming back from the afl like can you tell us about the um the challenges of trying to get back into playing football after being away with afl for a while and even just finding what position suits you best after coming back yeah i guess um what jack tried me midfield against limerick more so because I was fairly conf confident or comfortable there. Um, it's pretty universal in terms of how much attack and defending you do. Um, it's more so a case of just getting out there and getting the feel of the ball, getting the feel of the pace of the game again. Um, yeah, it, it's it, it definitely is tricky coming back because you have to try figure out how to kick for me and how to kick the ball again, where to run, where not to run, off ball um, positioning, um, and that only comes at games. So. I guess hopefully now, hopefully now next year I can get a couple more games under my belt and try to figure it all out. Mm, Michael, was it uh, was it difficult going away, Stefan? Uh, it's a big uh, it's a big move to make at an early stage of your life, and even a lot of the talk would have been around the time you left that you know there was a golden generation of Kerry footballers coming, and you'd obviously had a lot of success at at minor and under twenty. <laughs> um, uh, I suppose was it difficult to leave from a personal point of view, and was it difficult to leave? Uh, knowing maybe what you were leaving behind in Kerry. Yeah, it was definitely difficult um, when they offered the contract the first time around. So initially, I went out there when I was 17 or 18 for like a combine in Florida, then Australia, and didn't get a contract that time around. So when the contract came around a year later, I didn't jump jump at it straight away. I, I had to speak to my family first because football was going really well, college was going well. Um, I guess I was on that typical career path of progressing to the up the ranks um, through in Kerry plus plus college graduating college etc. So it definitely wasn't an easy decision to make. Um, but if I had my time back, I, I wouldn't change it for a thing. I I I look back with really fond memories of my time in Australia, regardless of all the injuries I had. What was that like? What was it like being a a pro sports person? It's it's what mo you know anyone involved in sport is generally what they what they dream of. Was it everything you expected it to be? Yeah, it's not. I guess it's not as rosy as, as you may think is for me i completely overlooked the fact that I, I could potentially be injured for two two out of three years i thought i'd, I'd be out there i'd learn i'd learn the learn the ropes relatively quickly um and start kicking the lights out and i was i was 20 probably a bit naive in my in my approach to it all 
Um, but one thing I kind of struggled with early days was how much spare time you had. Like you're, you're pretty much lethargic throughout all preseason for the four months. You had no no energy to do anything else. Um, so yeah, you, you have a lot of spare time. I guess you can you can focus on different avenues in your life. What, what interests you? I, I picked up reading. I guess um, read yeah quite a lot in my spare time. And yeah. What would be but, your yeah. favorite books? Yeah. Actually, can't but ask that. Um, Sapiens by Doctor. Oh, yeah, you, take you forever read. to read that. Yeah, I, I've read all, all all three of them. It's yeah. I've read them all twice and it's like ridiculous. It's just changed your perspective. You learn so much. And um, that hands down my favorite book. Just yeah. on what you say about the free time, Stefan, can you see how, you know, particularly uh, it's obviously mentioned about pro soccer players a lot, how <laughs> they're almost bored and a lot would maybe get into, you know, say, gambling or something like that. Can you see that when you're actually in that kind of bubble and you see the amount of free time, it's easy kind of find maybe uh, not the best distractions, shall we say? Yeah. Um, it definitely opens opens gates towards a, the negative aspects in terms of the distractions, but I don't know. It's a, like soccer players are they're in a different mindset to to AFL players, and they're not exactly paid twenty mil per year, so they're not in the in, in the same thinking space. Um, I think AFL players are fairly simple to get get a guides, like heads on screwed, relatively screwed. Um, <laughs> but um. Yeah, look, it, I, I can see what happens, and, and it does happen, but it happens across all sporting codes, you know. Um, Gambling is, is, is a huge issue, but they brought, they have a few campaigns that bring it to light in Australia, so kind of keeps players in a straight and narrow. Did you have a good network around you when you were out in Australia? Was there plenty of other Irish out there? Heaps of Irish, so I was quite lucky. My first year, like, in my first year, my best mate was out there. My second year, another another childhood friend and my sister flew out there so anytime I was homesick I always had them to bounce off and I, as you know there's Irish fellas everywhere I, I had fellas texting me to to go, go down to get a football training games the whole time so it was all, it was nice to get a fix of your Irish accents and was there any homesickness for you like obviously that happens for plenty of people um, I'm not I'm not quite I, I, I wouldn't classify myself as a home bird but um I was definitely it, it, it's hard I'm not the best to kind of judge my emotions I think when I was injured, you had so much spare time to yourself and so much spare, spare time in this thing up here in, in your mind. Like, I guess I kind of forced myself to be homesick, but maybe I was just missing being un, uninjured or being injury free, you know? So I, I, I don't think there's, there's a time where I was, I was fully homesick. And, and while you say that you, you have no regrets of going out there, do you regret how it went in terms of like the injuries and do you feel it could have worked out differently if you weren't uh, laid up so often? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, de definitely could have. Um, like, I think in, in a previous interview, I was saying that I, I don't like focusing on the on the hypotheticals, what ifs, what ifs, because like you you'd be doing that for the rest of your life, you know. Like th things panned out the way they did. Um, I still made great, great lifelong friends, had a, a huge life experiences, changed my perspective on how I view the world. Um, and yeah, look, it's just the way just the way the, the cards are always dealt, I guess. And so, how, how do you attack this next season with uh, with the county in terms of like you know you've you've played under Jack O'Connor before. Obviously, you've been there for that last year or more. You were, I think, Monster Under Twenty Player of the Year under under Jack, so he knows you pretty well at this stage. Like, how do you approach this next season with Kerry? Because obviously, you want to get far more involved. Well, first and foremost, just try to get a bit of confidence back in, back into my body, um, and I, I think I'm getting there quite yeah quite quickly. I'm I'm pretty happy with how I'm progressing from from surgery. I guess next year is just a case of get the body right, do what I can, um, yeah, drive it on next year and try some of the spot on the on the starting team. When you yeah. say confidence in your body, Stefan, is that a case of just because there's been a few injuries over the last couple of years that there's nearly a worry, or is it just like the the injuries? Is it the injuries that you have already that you'd be a worry over, or is it a, just a confidence about your kind of body in general that you're fearful of picking up another knock? <clears throat> confidence about my body in, in general so i guess subconsciously you're like your, your style of play is completely restricted you're not playing as freely i think there's there's a couple of training sessions there last year where i was just thinking right it's a big big session big big practice game what's gonna what's gonna go next is my cat is it my calf my hamstring and like you you're, you can't be going going into games with that mindset you know um so my, my, my focus now is get my body right and, and take it from there just take it week by week 
do you feel there's a lot of uh, untapped potential? I was chatting to Kieran Byrne, who was uh, the loud player who was over. Um, he was over playing AFL for a good while, and it said it just took him a while to get back into things, and he had a couple of injuries and that as well. But he feels like he's kind of no more than yourself, getting a, maybe a clean run with injury now, and he feels there's you know a lot of uh, he's a lot of untapped potential. We'd say in the Gaelic world, would you feel the same? Yeah, completely. Yeah, I, I haven't had a, I haven't had four or five weeks spell without without being injured this uh, the last twelve months. So. I really am looking forward to what I can bring to the table. Mm. Of, of all the players that you're playing with uh, in Kerry, is it just pretty obvious to say that David Clifford is the most talented one in there? I'm sure he does ridiculous things in training that are probably even you know, better than some <laughs> of the things that he's done in matches. Yeah, look, so in training now, it's never an easy feat, so I'm either marking Cliffy or, or Sean Yoshe. Um, like the, the, hardest part, the hardest person I find to mark on a wet day in particular is to, um, Tony Brosnan. Like he just, yeah, he'd spin on a, on a two pence. He's very, very skillful, very quick, agile. And yeah, he's he probably doesn't get as much um, publicity, but no, he's he's a great player also. Yeah, and could you see uh, Clifford? Would Clifford have made it in the AFL? Do you think? Is he the sort like because every maybe it's a different type of athlete <laughs> they want? I'm not sure, but do you, would you have seen him succeed there? Yeah, yeah, definitely. He's tall. He's strong. He's quick. Um, has a great mindset. So yeah, no, I, I think he would have, he would have done well. But fortunately for Clifford, he stayed, he stayed in, he stayed put. Yeah, yeah. And, and how do you think Kerry are set in terms of like the defence of the Sam Maguire next year? Do you think you're in a good position to defend it? Um, yeah, I think compla- definitely can't be complacent tackling next year. Um, and I'm looking forward to the inaugural meeting that we have before the before the start before the start of next season, just to kind of recap of the last year and how how we'll tackle the the following year. But I definitely don't think um it'll be an easy feat with Dublin being mm. Dublin having Paul and Jack back and. And just in terms of your uh, life away from the field, so obviously you come back, people, you trade one sport for another in a way. But in terms of your, like you're no longer a professional sportsman, did it take you long to adjust to getting back and being like, okay, what am I doing in terms of work and, and adjusting to that? Um, I think I was lucky in that respect, as in I had college to, to resume. I was back into third year. So I just I, I, could have, I had a leave of absence every single year. So I was back straight back into third year <clears throat> after maybe three months of. Kind of finding my bearings again with, with with life and yeah i had college and friends and family to kind of occupy me or and football i guess mm-hmm. and did that take even a bit of adjustment going back to college yeah it definitely did um but i think being being a small bit older a bit more driven definitely worked in my favor mm. and, and where are you in college and what are you doing um i'm in ul trying to finish a biomedical engineering degree yeah okay so what's what's the plan in terms of like what sort of job would we see you in down the line then Sure, if you if you have some dodgy hips, I'll, I'll, I'll design it. And that's the next few years I'll design for you. You get plenty of work from the GA, I'd imagine, uh, in the years ahead. <laughs> Mike, anything else you want to ask? Yeah, no. Um, I don't know if Jack is listening or not, but what's your preferred position, Stefan? If you were to nail, if you're to try and nail down one position, with Kerry, what, where would it be? Because people, some people say three, some people say six. Uh, he obviously tried your midfield at different stages when you were fit last year. Where would you where would you see yourself? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm probably most comfortable at <coughs> at midfield, but I don't mind having a having a role like tagging a player for the for the game as well. So mm-hmm. I think okay. I'm most comfortable spot. Okay, uh, who do you think um, is going to win the? Um, I think it's going to be between Listry and Fossa. I don't know if you've been keeping much of an eye on that, but Clifford scored nine points again in the weekend or in the Premier Junior Final. Would you be keeping an eye on things at that level? Um, yeah, I, I'd keep yeah relative to those conversation with me. It's I'd say Fossa. Okay, okay, going to be hard to stop the old Cliffords. Okay, well, look, it's been brilliant having you on the show, Stefan, and uh, best of luck with the season ahead, and hopefully the injuries clear up. Lovely, thanks a million, lads. Great chat, Stefan. Good man. All the best. Okay, so we've uh, we'd a bit go ahead there. Yeah, just the thought there's an interesting comment from DG. It just says, uh, in relation to what Stefan was saying there, your nervous system remembers the previous injuries, even if your symptoms or tissues have healed. You have to build trust back in the nervous system. Otherwise, you keep getting reoccurrences. Uh, it's funny, like, particularly you've had hamstrings as well, Shane. And once they go, I, I don't think there's any injury like a hamstring to, to play with your head. You just, it's, it takes so long to let yourself to kind of just be free again and just run without thinking. I don't think, I, I often chat some of the older boys when I'm down training with Burr. I can't remember the last time I ran 100%. Um, just because, like, I, I no, I, I just, you, you can't. You restrict yourself. You'd run at 85, 90 maybe, but you're restricting yourself. You're trying to use your head a bit more. 
uh, and the last I actually sorry I can last time I ran at 100% I gave myself a full blown hamstring tear so I do remember the last time we were doing sprints uh, madly enough the Thursday night before the Wednesday night before a Friday night championship game a few sprints at the end end of training when you're not fresh and uh, I wasn't thinking about it all and I just boom sniper sniper up in the stand in St. Brendan's Park but it's um, I think Stefan is a player that that Jack would have loved to have last year and like if someone like him can stay fit this year like just he'd be a he's a, such a big weapon to have I'd say anywhere between probably three and nine I'd say and even when he talks about the likes of Tony Brosnan like and even Jack Savage was talking about a couple of weeks ago the level of depth there with guys that aren't even seeing game time and the class they have in their squad no we talk, and he mentioned himself about Paul Mannion and Jack McCaffrey but as a squad Kerry have a phenomenal squad at the moment and they obviously have the best player in the country as well in David Clifford. Yeah, Richard Hogan says Kevin Mahoney, obviously a Bally Gunner, must be very close to the county team. Couldn't understand how Cahill didn't use him last year. Got serious pace too. ML89 says from tip uh, from playing tip clubs and results the last 10 years or so, always felt they're behind tactically, too reliant on lads just doing something themselves. Burris were different to the rest and it showed obviously getting to the All-Ireland Final. So, and I would have had a few people kind of getting on to me yesterday and almost using Killer One's heavy defeat as a stick to beat Tipperary with and be like, you know, Tipperary clubs just can't get it done at this level. Obviously, Ballygunner have just been fantastic. And other teams from from Watford have gotten pretty far and won Munster titles over recent years. So there's been a bit of representation from, from those sides. But uh, yeah, Tipperary teams have come up a little bit short. But I don't know, I, like... <laughs> It's a it's a tough one to to get your head around. Like, do you think it's a tactical thing that Tipperary clubs are a little bit behind that way? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have said tactically. Um, no, like we played Killadang in a couple of times, and they bamboozled us a bit with the way they were playing, and two men inside and one man inside, and you know, a second centre forward at times as well. So, um, I can't speak for playing. No, we played Killeran. We played Killeran uh, in COVID at one stage, and they tactically were very very astute as well. And you didn't know exactly what way they were playing nearly until the game was over. So I don't know. I don't know if I'd say that the results and the result yesterday doesn't look pretty. I would say. I'd say, uh, being honest, I'd say like even if Killeran had a full complement, Bally Gunner to me probably five or six points better than them. I would say anyway. And that's that's not that's not to do with Killeran. That's more to do with, with the level that Bally, uh, Bally Gunner are at, at the moment. But seventeen points probably looked particularly bad yesterday. Just, but like, geez, there's a lot of mitigating circumstances. And you, yes, you can say there are excuses if you want. I don't like you have one or two excuses, but when it's when it's seven or eight, like and things are just stacking up, and they're not being smart. The the week break is a real killer, and there's no point in saying any different. Uh, Liam O'Kelly said that that killer on went back training on Wednesday and Thursday, and they did a bit Wednesday, Wednesday and Thursday, but. Like they would have really enjoyed themselves a few days before that, and and they were more than like they were more than uh, justified to do that. And I'm sure they enjoyed themselves last night, based on a couple of things Demo Kelly said to me about their their bus journey home and how he told told none of them to drive down their cars or leave their cars anywhere because they wouldn't be driving their cars home tonight. He said he didn't know when we're getting on a bus now. I don't know when that bus will get home. Uh, they were going to enjoy themselves, and you, you could part of you could say they were landing down to Walsh Park, and they knew what was what was awaiting them, and that it was a bit of a jolly. I definitely would not say that at all, and I think they were very full blooded in everything they did on the pitch. But lads were, you know, it was walking wounded there in the last fifteen or twenty minutes, and you're just trying to survive. Really, you look at someone like Keno Kelly in the second half, like he was he was going full blooded at it, but there was just very little there, and. He was that was along with many other guys as well. Like Liam O'Kelly said, four lads made their senior debuts yesterday off the bench. They made their senior debuts against the best team in the country. That's just that's just where they were at a week after winning the county final. And I definitely don't think it will cloud winning their first county title in 37 years. I also probably don't think it should cloud like that Tipperary Club Harlan is in an awful state or anything like that. Yeah, so Richard Hogan here says Bally Gunner could have lost a lot more and did lose to Burris Lee. And John Collins says, to be fair, celebrations um, have a bit to do with performances of Tipperary champions. Recent winners haven't won titles for a generation or more. Yeah, there have been new winners in each of the last six years. And I think it was very hard on Kiladangan that they weren't able to play Munster a couple of years ago because I would have been really interested to see how they would have gone in that. Um, but the way Bally Gunner communicate with each other on the pitch, like they're just such a well-drilled uh, team. And like, 
you look at some of the best teams in the country and you just you just know that these Bally Gunner lads are chatting to each other in between games in terms of like how can we evolve our tactics, how can we organize our defense, what we should be say, what should we be saying to each other. The way that like any time and I know Killer One had the wind in the first half, and that sometimes causes your entire team to drift up the field because the deliveries are going a bit further. But they got dragged really far up the field. They ended up uh, like hitting long puck outs, and a lot of them were going very far from Paddy Williams. But unfortunately, they're going in, you know, in areas that are crowded by Bally Gunner, and Bally Gunner are brilliant at winning rock ball, and then they're able to switch it into space. Like think of the amount of times that Philip Mahoney would switch it out onto the wing for Park Mahoney to get it, or somebody else, or they'd work it up the field. There's and always the somebody there, Shane, as well. There's mm. always an outlet on the wing. They literally yeah, Mikey know Mahoney, that. Kevin, yeah. Kevin Mahoney, it doesn't matter. And then like. It was grand when you had one Desi Hutchinson up there. Now you kind of have Desi Hutchinson plus Desi Hutchinson 2.0 in Patrick Fitzgerald. So it's going to become even more of a nightmare for teams. But the other thing is the amount, like when Bally, sorry, when Killer One got a ball, somebody like Jerome Cahill or Keno Kelly or whoever it is would turn and the amount of Bally Gunner traffic they'd beat up against. And they were just getting stifled all the time. They had to work so hard for scores. And I thought they got some of them quite well, uh, especially in that first half. But they'd work so hard, and then just the ball would go up the other end of the field, and Ballygunner would have cancelled it out straight away. And you know, it's just this typical sign of a classy team that Ballygunner have, or that they are. And it was just too a bridge too far for Killer One. And look, it was a pretty disappointing result. But you know, I still thought they had a great season. And as I said, they were in Bursley last night. They were enjoying themselves. I don't think it'll take too much out of them in terms of like ruining what has been a brilliant year. And then Jerome Cattle, who I've been talking a lot about, let's get him back for tip. As he said to me last night, you're making life very difficult for me. But he was saying with a smile on his face. So <laughs> um, I have to say, like on Bally Gunner, like their defensive shape. Uh, and I'm not just talking about two to seven here. I'm talking about when they're defending. There, it's very Limerick esque in the sense of there is no space. Um, and there's there's not like it never happens with Bally or Bally Gunner. Much like it never happens with Limerick, where you break a line and you know you're true. You know, if you break a line with Bally Gunner, there's another line, usually another line of bodies, or at least two waiting for you. And even when Willie Cleary did break that line, and it was a good run to break the line, there was still two lads right in on top of him. And you could say it was a last ditch hook. But even the way Stephen O'Keefe sets himself up on the line, he would have fancied himself to stop that shot, even if he was only six or seven yards out. Um, and the other player, and I know we've talked about him before, Paddy Levy is such an unsung hero in the sense of we talk about Patrick, you're, you know, as your Patrick Fitzgeralds, you know, your Desi Hutchinsons, and the lads that shoot the lights out, you know, Kevin Matney with two two and Hutchinson with three, Patrick Fitzgerald with one four. But Paddy Levy just gets on some amount of ball and he never wasted. And he actually hit the ball uh, in an orthodox fashion twice yesterday, which is something that I haven't seen a lot. He was delivering, he was delivering, it's the Levy ball. It's not even the brick flick, it's the Levy flick. Like he's nearly invented his own kind of flick. And he delivered the ball into the corner forward at one stage about 30 or 40 yards with this flick. And he just, he just holds possession so well and always does something economical and something that's good for the team. Yeah, no, he he is really good at using the ball. What would you call it? The the Levy loft or something like that. There's got to be oh, a term yes. out there. This is yeah. like you know Henman Hill and Murray Mound or something like that. We need to turn we need to turn it in. The brick flick needs to turn into. I think yeah, the the Levy loft is not bad now. In fairness, yeah, and even the way Peter Hogan soloed through and set up that goal towards the end of the first half, he just had the presence of mind to know what his options were. Paddy uh, Patrick Fitzgerald was clever enough to just drift off his man a little bit. Little ball across back of the net. But like even think of it in the second by the way, I should mention Kilowan had so many wides early on in the game, but that was yeah. down to Bally Gunner's pressure too. Another thing was the difference in like so I'm complimenting Bally Gunner when I say this, but they're a very cynical team as well. Like in the second half when and we saw that last year too. In the second half when Keno Kelly was solo and true, Barry Coughlin dumped him straight on the ground. And he's dead right to do it because the 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 rules at club level are still rewarding tackling players onto the ground. So he's dead right to do it because, you know, it meant that Killer One get, they couldn't get through for a goal. Whereas at the other end, a couple of times, the likes of Kevin Mahoney could get in when the defender, by right, should just wrestle him to the ground because it would have been a free rather than a penalty. So, um, yeah, I just think in every which way, every marginal gain going, Bally Gunner tend to avail of it. They even hit the ground a lot with the goal shots yesterday. Uh, like the goal that Paddy Williams conceded in the county final replay. There were probably a couple of goals yesterday that were somewhat similar to that. That low ball uh, sliding off the surface into the corner. 
um, and he probably wouldn't be wouldn't have been happy with one of them. I'd say as well. And it's funny you say about about Barry Coughlin there as well. Yeah, you're just operating within the rules, and until the rules are changed, uh, players are going to keep doing that at club level anyway, because obviously you can't do it at county level, but they're going to keep doing it at club level. Somebody said to me, I think yesterday, that Barry Coughlin's had the ball in his hands six times so far in the championship this year. That seems absolutely ludicrous, but. And like he's a very good ball player, and he's very good at carrying it. A very fast player, but um, I don't know. Is there anyone out there from um, a Ballygunner background that knows if that's true or not? But that's definitely something that I heard being uh, said. But, like they're not looking for one, yeah. They're yeah, not they're looking, not for looking for the player. Stop, yeah. Um, and it's funny. Uh, we played Dublin in 2011 with Offaly, and I was marking Paul Ryan, and I actually didn't feel the weight of the ball in my hand uh, the same day. And some people would have said, "Just that was one of your better games." Um, so that's says that says about either how useless I am or uh, how that when you're playing in that kind of stopper role. Uh, see, the funny thing is, is if you look at there's different types of roles like that. Like Sean Finn is not a stopper of a corner back. He will stop you to a fair extent, but he's also you know he's the generator of a lot of moves uh, and starts with the ball, starts the ball. Uh, you know, starts the attack kind of moving again. So depends what you're looking for in a player. I think they, I think they tried to play it to Barry Coughlin's strengths. Um, and that's a fascinating one. I definitely, I'll try and, fi- I'll try and find out uh, how true that is. I would, I wouldn't be that surprised. I don't think he got the ball in his hand yesterday. Anyway, not to the best of my recollection. Anyway. Yeah. So we know that the on one side of the draw for Munster Championship, it's going to be Ballier against Saint Finbars, and we're looking forward to talking about that. And the fact, I mean, later in the week, the fact that you've got. Um, the same coach for both teams, which is a strange enough one. It only happened in the GA, and we're going to have Napierschik against Bally Gunner. People have probably been talking about it for a while. This is the sort of dream monster semi-final. It's going to be a cracker. Even Darrell Sullivan, the Bally Gunner manager, was asked about it afterwards, and like you know that he knew this game was coming, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. And uh, like it's just you mentioned about like two juggernauts coming up against each other and that's that's what it is uh, and to me like this needs the wwe treatment or some sort of a build-up like music package to it like do you know what i mean because and i'm glad it has it's a nice two-week build-up like i can't wait for it at this stage and we're 13 days away and i'd say most hurling supporters and ga supporters are the same um and like if bally gunner are to you know attempt to do back-to-back all irelands they're going to have to beat you know they're probably going to have to beat the Pearshig probably going to have to beat Ballyhale along the way and potentially a Thomas' side as well. So it's going to, they're going to have to do it the hard way. And But it seemed like they were almost relishing the prospect of going to the Gaelic grounds. Darrell Sullivan mentioned it. Uh, Stephen O'Keefe mentioned it to us after as well. So I just think, um, yeah, it's going to be a belter of a game. Cracking, cracking game. Here's an interesting one from John O'Sullivan. Ian Kenny, this is the Bally Gunner and Waterford quarterback, used to be in primary school at Columns Blan in Castle Lines before Kenny's family moved to Waterford. So that's an interesting one there. And this is uh, ML89. I suppose this is talking about not getting on the ball so much. Alan, Alan Kearns played the full minor All-Ireland in goals in 1994. Didn't touch the ball a single time. No saves and wasn't taking the puck outs. The fullback took them. So that's no quite way. That's unbelievable. <laughs> who played yeah. Who played in goals in, in an All-Ireland final and never touched the ball? There's a great trivia question. Jesus. Mm. Played the full game and never touched the ball. Uh, a- AP123, think the Pearson could put away a lot of the chances Killer One missed in the first half. Breen, Dempsey, Casey. Um, let's see, Sean O'Sullivan, can I put a word on for the GA as a whole? Love the league season is over in one year, no more long waits. Yeah, I mean, imagine if we had to go and had this huge three month wait for an All Ireland semi final, you know, that sort of stuff coming down the tracks. It was annoying. Let's just keep playing these games, they're absolutely brilliant. Yeah, well, you're trying to peak at several different times. Like, and some t- clubs got it well. In fairness to Padre Whelan and Borry, always got that break well. But it was such an unnecessary thing. Like, the guts of probably about you know ten or eleven weeks is just no no need for it. Now teams that are going, they can just go the whole way through, and you're not going up and down and trying to peak at different times. You can kind of stay steady the whole way through. I think it's definitely a much better set up. Yeah, so the Connacht uh, Club Intermediate Hurling Championship semi-final, Turin beat St. Gabriel's of London, 117 to 112. Uh, the Munster Intermediate Hurling Club Championship quarter-final, Ross Grace off Bally Saggart, 421 to 15 points. But look, we knew that Kieran Bennett wasn't available to play for Bally Saggart. And when Shane Bennett, who'd made a lovely couple of driving runs early in the game, once he went off injured, that was kind of all she wrote. And uh, and to be fair to Ross Gray, they really did kick on. Connor Sheedy scored one uh, six. Luke Cashin he also scored one six, and they just had a lot of different players who stepped up and did lots of score. Now Stephen Bennett he scored nine point six. Those were frees, 
Uh, but it, they, they were just pulling away throughout this uh, second half, weren't they? Ah, they were, in fairness. And I thought uh, Bally Sagard were a huge price coming into it. I think they were 15-2. to two. It was tight enough at half time. But as you say, when, when Shane Bennett comes off, like a player like that, at that level, when you lose someone like that, he's obviously hit two points. He set up a couple of scores as well. Um, you just can't afford to lose someone like that. That's not to say that he was the reason why they lost by, what, six, 18 points in the wind-up. But uh, it, def- it definitely wouldn't have helped. But Ross Gray looked like a team on a, on a mission. Um, we saw an interview with Conor Sheedy there after. Again, like they're going back up into the senior level at, in Tipperary. You'd, like When will they get another chance maybe for a Munster run like this? So I think they're gonna. It looks like they're gonna take it with uh, with both hands. And another team, obviously, going on a good run are St Joseph's Dora Bearfield. Uh, they beat the Kerry champions Causeway one twenty three to one sixteen. So a powerful second half turnaround ensured that St Joseph's Dora Bearfield, they're obviously uh, All Ireland champions back in nineteen ninety nine, outpowered uh, outpowered Causeway in what was uh, deemed an enten- entertaining enough a game in Cusick on Saturday afternoon. So it's a per- first provincial victory for Dora Bearfield. Uh, since they were All Ireland champions in 1999 and did an awful lot of strength in depth, um, and it's it, like Causeway hadn't played in three months, but this is still surely disappointing from a Kerry Hurland point of view and from Stephen Malumphy's point of view that your marquee team within the club couldn't uh, defeat a Clare team operating in the second tier and the Clare top tier. Remember, has Clare top tier has 16 teams, I think. So you're playing the 17th. Uh, Derek or one of the lads might correct me there but I think they're playing like the 17th best team in Clare and for the best team in Kerry not to come out on top you'd have to say is hugely disappointing from a Causeway point of view and from a Kerry point of view as well I thought it was three groups of four in Clare this year maybe I'm wrong on that but um, hopefully somebody like Derek Lynch there from Clare FM will, will correct us uh, the Munster Junior uh, Hurling Championship quarterfinal reigning champions Bally Gidlin beat Grange Mokler Bally Neal by two, uh, 210 to 11 points uh, good victory there. Would have to say, I think it's a fairly ropey pair of togs that uh, Bally Giblin wear. They've got that sort of, sort of their, their red and white hoops, and then the shorts are white, but it sort of fades into red towards the end of them. It's Look, I'm not slating, look, those shorts, you know, talk to me about them, Bally Giblin I, people. I, I'm not I'm not slating them, but I am. <laughs> but uh, Cork footballer Carl O'Mahony scored a, a late goal there. He looks yeah, like a, a tasty lefty, old hurler. Yeah. Yeah, he brought, he brought he broke the line at one stage, a nice good, nice finish, and I believe he put over a line cut as well. Um, so it, it, I wasn't aware, I I hadn't seen him uh, been involved uh, with Bally Giblin last year. He obviously was, but it just kind of slipped under the radar. But he's very very good footballer, one of the real up and coming forwards in Cork. He's obviously uh, he's obviously a decent dual player as well. Yeah, Dara Flynn, Cork under twenty hurler. He also scored a goal there as well. Banner beat uh, Kilgarvan in another junior um, Munster quarter final. 211 wasn't from Shane Meehan, Jesus, at this level. And they only got to a quarter final in Clare, as we as we talked about last um last Thursday. And even in the football, they were knocked out before the quarter final. So it's pretty much was it September 11th, we said was the last time they had played. So they've done very well to get over the line here. Yeah, no, they have, in fairness. Um, we've kind of waxed lyrical about about me and a good bit, him and uh him and Mark Rogers are two forwards, uh, two forwards that are, you know, forwards that could be potentially, ca- you know, county stars for Clare for the next, you know, 10 to 12 years. And he obviously showed all his class at the weekend. I think there was there was two or three lads on him at different stages and they couldn't handle him. Uh, interesting there, Adrian McGrath says there was 18 teams in Clare this year. So if Dora Bearfield are the 19th best team, I have to say that's even more disappointing from a from a Kerry point of view, especially after Kilmiley's ex place last year, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the Ulster Club Intermediate Quarterfinal, Middletown, Nafina of Armagh beat Owen Rue of Derry, 19 points to 113. We'll give you the junior quarterfinal results in Ulster as well. Shane O'Neill's of Antrim beat Carrick Macross, 427 to 112. Sean Tracy's of Armagh, South Coothill Celtic of Cavan, 512 to 112. Santa of Donegal had a little bit too much for Owen Rue of Dungannon, 116 to 211. And the Maha of Derry had a 418 to 112 win over Common Padder Neafa, which is Warren Point. Uh, in the Camogie, the Munster semi final, Scarf Ogonlow, they beat Sarsfield 16 points to 111. Lucy Allen was a big loss for Sarsfield there. Abby Walsh was brilliant at midfield for Scarf and hit a couple of points. Eva Power, very good also. Um, Drum and Inch beat De La Salle 314 to 18 points, which is a huge win for, um, for, for Drum and Inch and uh, disappointing for John Milan and Co. 
Yeah, after extra time, obviously as well. So that was uh, that was a rip roaring game. Uh, don't know the drum win. The drum win last year. I can't remember. They won. They won a Munster title either last year or either. Sorry, yeah, either twenty twenty one or twenty twenty. Um, and Dennis Al were obviously first time uh, Waterford champions this year, so they will be definitely disappointed. But again, the more than killer on it won't take away from from a great from a great year. Um, there was obviously a serious amount of football action over the over the weekend as well, Shane, and we might get into it straight away. We kind of mentioned Nace and Crokes earlier on. Um, a difficult uh, difficult moment for for Cahill Daly. Just I. Like it just the keeper had given him the ball, so I don't know if subconsciously you would realise that the keeper is off the line when you overplay the ball. He took six or seven steps, the referee blew it. But you would always be taught, you'd always be taught, like you hold on to the ball nearly, or you give the ball to the referee, or you do whatever you have to do and regroup and get set up. And again, it's probably uh, modern football probably kind of plays into it. It's not something you think maybe that your goalkeeper is going to be off the line, but he was and. You know, it was a mistake from from Carl Daly, obviously, but very, very quick thinking from Darren Mullins' point of view. Um, I don't know if you saw um, Podolski's goal over the over over the weekend when you you know he scored from inside his own half, saw the keeper was off his line. The, you know, really intuitive players will just spot an opportunity and it's bang. And that was it wasn't a game changing moment, but it definitely saps the morale out of out of Nace a bit. You you know, there's enough obstacles you already have, have to overcome in. Shane Walsh and Co and Craig Diaz and how good Crocs are, you can't hand them scores like that. Yeah, definitely not. I mean, once you're handing a goal or two to to kill McCud Crocs, you're gonna very much struggle to get back into the game. I even remember seeing him against Thomas Davis in the semi-final. Crocs conceded one one early on. You thought, geez, the Thomas Davis have a chance of a bit of a shock here, but just Crocs stifled the life out of them for the rest of the game. And as soon as that goal went in, you were struggling to see where Nace would come back into the game. Darren Mullen, very, very clever. I mean, we talk about Bally Gunner and knowing how to do the right things at the right time, slow down the game, do the cynical foul if you need it. I mean, as a manager, you must be pulling your hair out when you see a player putting the ball down on the ground, doesn't stand in front of the free taker, goalie out of the field, and you watch that ball go in. It must be like, you know, just in slow motion, you're watching your dreams fade in front of you because it's just such an unnecessary way to hand the onus over to, to Crokes and more or less put yourself in... A very difficult position. Very unfortunate from Daly's point of view as well, because he knew straight away as well. He he knew straight away, and that's it's it's unfortunate. And Jesse, the last thing we want to do is 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 highlight it too much. But I suppose it's it's no more than when Offaly played Tip in the in the minor final this year, and Tip got that last minute goal. There were so many. It was a great goal by by McCormack, but there were so many things done wrong from an Offaly point of view that will probably never happen again. And it's definitely something that that Cottle Daly or Nace will never will never do it again. They'll probably be they'll probably, you know, veer to the side of being cynical next time and holding on to the ball like that and not letting it go like some of the soccer teams do when a team is gets his team is two 0 down or something like that and they can see the goal and there's only a minute or two left and some lad holds on to the ball and there's a big there's a big kind of a row ensuing or things like that. But uh Crokes are just so battle hardened, so smart. Uh, again, similar to we talk about the Limerick footballers, we talk about Bally Gunner hurlers, uh, so methodical, they never leave themselves open, uh, ra- well, rarely leave themselves open. If a player breaks the line, there's always another player ready to come to them. Um, and obviously, that All Ireland final loss last year would have hurt them. And they've only wanted, they want to talk about it publicly, but they've only one thing on their mind, and that's, uh, that's getting the Andy Merrigan into their hands uh, early next year. Mm. And Adrian McGrath says third monster in four years for Scarfo Donalo, all three versus Drum and Drum and Inch. Massive incentive for Drum after the two previous defeats. Definitely is. Um, and uh, in the le- let's move on to the Ulster Football Championship. We'll come back to Leinster. But Bally Bay, their second half display against Kilku saw them sees them through to, to um, a match against Kilku, who they met 10 years ago in the Ulster Championship. And the gas part about this is that Jerome Johnson Sr. is the joint manager of Bally Bay. He's going to be managing against his sons in the next round of the Ulster Championship. Going to be some crack in that house for the next week or two. <laughs> Bally Bay for drinking tea. Uh, the great <laughs> Oliver Brady, who used to own a lot, own and train a lot of horses, he said, Bally Bay for drinking tea. Monaghan drinks brandy. And he had another little part to it about Castle Blaney uh, eating sugary candy. Um, but uh, that was some win for, for Bally Bay because by all accounts, like we'd probably written them off most people had it was how competitive 
uh, Ulster, the Ulster Club Football Championship was, but when you were talking about potential winners, Bally Bay were well down when you were talking about potential winners, and you were talking about Glenn, Kilku, and probably Cross, uh, maybe in, in that order, or Kilku and Glenn maybe uh, swapping swapping positions, but serious uh, serious performance, and like there were several examples again of you know a lot of owl fellas just ha- still going strong at club level. Paul Finley was in his first ever Ulster Club Football Championship match was man at, was man at a match like out, outrageous play, again. I think he played against Kil- Kilku ten years ago. Apologies, sorry, apologies. In his first game in ten years, then, mm. um, like he's brilliant. Like just the, the thing about it is when you have a wand of a left foot like that, he and I all, often talk about it like. He'll still he can still kick football when he's fifty. Like once you have a weapon like that at your at your disposal, it's the same if you're able to take freeze and line balls and hurling, and you stay nimble enough, you can stay playing junior probably well into your fifties if you're able to even move ten or fifteen yards. But that was a serious performance, uh, and they, they obviously didn't fear across the other night, and they won't fear what awaits them in the next round either. And I'm just looking at the name of the goalkeeper for Bally Bay, Julius Snautska. I think is how it might be pronounced. That that's quite a name. I'd love I'd love to know a little bit more about where he's from. Or I know, actually from tried to area. find out because I actually tried to find out because it was sent to me the other night, and uh, I, I got onto someone from Monaghan, and they hadn't a clue. So we'll have it for we'll have it for Thursday's show. I'm sure there's a good story to that. No more than uh, Victor Manzo in St Thomas's. And ML89 says, Cross McGlenn have been very poor in Ulster since last winning it 10 years ago. Still think of them as the monster up north, sweeping through everyone. Bally Bay were comfortable enough winners. Uh, so back into Leinster then, Port Arlington beat Palatine 319 to 9 points. So that was that was a bit of a mother and father of Baytons, really. Uh, the Downs saw off St. Mary's of RD 117 to 12. It's a, it's a bit of a mad story that four of the Downs footballers were in Mexico during the week. Yeah, it's a great story, isn't it? They only came back on Friday and they rejoined training on Friday. So it's funny, actually, because Luke Lachlan wasn't one of them and he was obviously involved in Westmead, but it was the Westmead team holiday for winning the Talchon Cup, which, again, is another great another great development uh, from the Talchon Cup because not only have you silverware to play for, but you have that sort of a prize. And people can say, oh, you don't get involved in the GA for holidays and trips obviously you don't but it's obviously a, a great nugget and a great benefit of it too so the their manager uh lar wall was just talking after the match and he just said the mexico thing last week was a big worry but thankfully the lads came through and put in an enormous shift the four of them so the four of them were trevor martin charlie drum jonathan lynham and kevin o'sullivan uh to spend a week in mexico and come out there they came on on friday morning they came home on friday morning so we had them friday evening it was all about trying to put energy back into them and adjusting the body clock. Uh, an interesting one there as well. I thought I thought Mary Zardy would put up a better show on than that. I know they had a, a lot of injuries. I know Donald McKinney's out with a, a cruciate injury and they had a couple of other injuries, but I still thought they'd put up a better show on there. The downs play um, Rat Oath, and geez, like it's a massive opportunity. When you look at what Crokes have to go through to get to even a Leinster final by beating Nace, who were in the final last year, and beating Port Harrington, who had beaten the semi final last year, the downs and Rat Oath. Like, you know, one of them is going to be in the Leinster final and you wouldn't have probably predicted that at the start of the year. And for Lar Wall, he knows uh, Rat Oath very well because he was over Kells last year when uh, Rat Oath beat him with an injury time goal, I think, or an injury time score in the mid final in 2021. So uh, that'll be interesting. He, he, won't, he mightn't have to do as much research as he would with a normal team, but a huge opportunity there and probably probably right to get into the Rat Oak game now and the, the shenanigans, more shenanigans that were involved there. Yeah, so like David Brady had got a red card from the county final uh, himself and Conor Gillespie had a bit of a, a coming to, we'll put it that way. It was rescinded. And then in this game, he ends up in a bit of an altercation with, I think it's Anton Sullivan and a bit of shouting with a couple of the road players. Rat Oak won 11 points to nine. But um Brady was asked about it afterwards and he goes, you know, there was a there was a sideline ball and a bit of an issue there. And he goes, that wasn't me now. It actually wasn't me. Someone interpreted it was they turned around and went, of course it was Brady. I think you've seen it. But anyway, look, you're going to uh, you're you're going to yourself. Boys, uh, you're playing into our hands. We're up. And then afterwards he added in. Yeah, because you're going, boys, get away from that. Uh, look, at, I think someone actually thought I did something and I didn't. Someone else did. it, But you give a dog a bad name anyway. Let's talk about other things. So <laughs> as, as the man says. Yeah, as the man says, yeah. So a uh, bit of a why always me type of uh, vibe to it. A bit, yeah. Ah, listen, um, it, it's been a similar scenario in the last two games. Rat Oath have been up 
And like, I don't know, like Brady ended up in a bit of a, a bit of a schmazzle, obviously with Gillespie in the county final. I have to wonder how that red card was rescinded if he was given a, if he was given a red card. Because when you look at the, the video footage after, it's clear that he did kind of, you know, he did interfere, shall we say, with Conor Gillespie. And then Conor Gillespie interfered with him a bit more uh, than maybe Brady did. So I, I'm not sure exactly. It just shows you maybe how, how easy it is to get things rescinded nowadays. But uh, in both situations, Rat Road were up by a point or two. And like, you're never happy for something like that to happen. But they were in a situation where it was playing into their hands even more. And he said it after the county final. It played into their hands. Summer Hill needed a score. It was grand for us. Road needed a score yesterday. So it was playing into their hands. And it's gas. Uh, we played a junior B football final recently. And for Ban, we're up by a couple of points. And same again. Something happened with five or ten minutes to go. And I kind of half got involved in it as well. And you kind of only realise after... Jesus, sure, that's probably what they wanted. Just slow the game down and time waste. But sometimes in the heat of it all, it's very hard not to. But uh, what will be David Brady's next trick? That's the, that's the question in the semi final. There'll definitely be something anyway. Just a reminder, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code RGAME and you'll get 15% off. There's a huge range of jerseys there. Not to mention the ones that we're wearing today. This Clare one, that Dublin one over at that site. Uh, the Limerick football final was on at the weekend. It went to extra time and it's uh, a sixth title for Newcastle West, who beat it there, 1-11 to 2-5. It's the first time they retained the Father Casey Cup, and as I said, it had to go to extra time. And Mike McMahon, he scored 1-3. Thomas Quilligan and Dermot Kelly got a couple of points as well. On the Adair side, Robbie Burke hit 1-1. Mark Connolly hit 3. Shane O'Connor scored the goal there. So that's a big win for them. And as we'd mentioned... Just on that, Shane, Mike, Mike, on that? Mike, Mike, Mike McMahon, I think, turn, turns 38, I think, in very, very soon. But he's a big, tall, strong forward. And uh, he had a couple of massive plays in the game. Uh, two of the goals in the game. Oh, were actually... one of those catches was unbelievable, wasn't it? Yeah, and you know what? The catch was unbelievable, but it's bananas to think, right? So he caught the ball and he fell. So, but while he's falling, he has to put his hand up to make sure the referee knows it's a mark. Like who, who came up with this hairbrained idea? Like it's absolutely bizarre. It really, really is. It should be. I don't know what way you do it, but like putting your hand up in the air, there should be a whistle blown. And if he stops and takes a second, then he's, t he's taking the mark. And if he doesn't stop for a second, we're playing on. And if he stops for two seconds, then you have to throw the ball up because it's his mistake. But the idea of putting your hand up, a lot of the time you're falling when you're catching or you're making a last ditch kind of a dive to catch it. So I just thought that was bizarre. And two of the goals actually scored in the game. It's funny. If, if, a lot of the time... A point of the effort that drops short can be the most potent pass in yeah. the world. It can be so potent because uh, the defender is probably sitting back because he's expecting it to go over. There was two goals scored with, with kind of fisted efforts yesterday. Um, but Newcastle West, by all accounts, were, were the better team in extra time anyway. But they were the ones that had to force, uh, they had to force extra time. They were struggling and they got a point in injury time. And then they were, by all accounts, they were the much the better team uh, an extra time, one by three. Yeah, and you, you mentioned an experienced player playing the forward line there. I forgot to mention that for Bally Saggart, their cornerback, Eugene O'Brien, 45 years of age. That's fair going bad. now. Yeah, That's a fair, fair going now, in fairness now. Yeah, um, we kind of mentioned it briefly earlier when Stefan Kunbor was on, but David Clifford, he scored nine points for, uh, for Fossa over the weekend as well. Just a, a week after being crowned footballer of the year, so they, um, and then obviously he was a huge part of beating Mid Kerry last week in the senior final. Eamon, Eamon Fitzmaurice is over that Fossa team, which is quite something as well. For a tiny little junior club to have two, you know, obviously Paddy as well as uh, David, two of the best players in the country, not to mention an All Ireland winning manager over the team, that's quite something. And some prospect for Mark O'Shea to face in the final. Yeah, it's not a bad gig for Eamon O'Shea, to, for Eamon, uh, Eamon Fitzmaurice to have now, is it? As junior teams go, they don't get more, much more high profile than managing the two Cliffords and Fox anyway. And like, there's a potential for David um, to be going on a monster run now, obviously, if they win that Premier Junior. Uh, I think it was, I think actually the Our Game channel had it earlier on there on Twitter. He's only, has he only lost two games this year? With, uh, one of them was the Sigerson Cup. Uh, final and one of them was a group game with Fossa in the Premier Junior Championship like that that's some year I'd say it still hurts him that he didn't win the Sigerson and he'd probably never play Sigerson again he was actually kind of reasonably well held in the final but whenever his year finishes Shane club wise 
they're going to have to send him off somewhere for you know a month or six weeks or let him not do anything for a while because to be a danger I know he's a young fella and that and he could probably be able to take it all but there's a danger of one year rolling into the next and around April or May when he should be bouncing for him to be a bit stale so I'm sure Jack O'Connor would be very very smart with minding him and the likes of Jack who he had on the show if he, if he's back around and Tony Brosnan and these guys would probably get maybe more of a look in in the league I'd say than they would have in previous years. Yeah the only thing is if he's not played let's say during the league um that will hit attendances actually at matches. You know, you'd imagine the Kerry County Board would actually want him to be lining out. So I wonder is that even a factor? Like in some ways you're like, we have to give this lad a rest, but in other ways it's gonna hit the coffers. And even like the TV stations, if they're showing Kerry, they're always hoping that Clifford is playing because people turn on simply to watch him. It's the Haaland effect with Man City. There you can't miss you have to watch them these days. If he's injured, you're less likely to watch. Very true, I, I agree with you, but you want him fit and healthy long term, and I think you can't, agree. Lose, yeah, you can't lose sight of the short term, oh, we want more bums on seats, or we want TG Carter to stump for this game on a Sunday, um, and I'm sure he'll want to play, but he has played a lot of football in 2022, mm. and they need to, be, need to be really careful with him. I don't know if he's carrying anything at the moment, he doesn't look like he is, but they need to be very smart with him. Yeah, absolutely, because you know, if a player plays that much year round, it, it might be now, it might be next year, it might be the year after all of a sudden you're a bit to late 20s and you're you're starting to get injury after injury and you definitely hope that doesn't happen with him because he's a star. Um, I'll just go through some other results as well and then you might talk to us a little bit about Dixborough. But uh, the Ulster Club Junior uh, Football Championship quarterfinals, Letter Kenny beat Derry Noose of Armagh by a point. Newtown Butler, first for Manas, had a 318 to 1 6 win over Patrick Pierce's of Belfast. And Drum Lane beat Clonus 111 to 13 points. The LGFA, Leinster LGFA Senior Club um, final, Kilmacud Croaks beat Tinahili 415 to 08. Ava Rutledge scored a hat trick. And in the Ulster Intermediate Club Ladies Football final, Derry Gonnelly beat Castle Ryan then 211 to 26. Uh, I tell you, the Croaks are at every level, aren't they? There, they sure they are. Yeah, in fairness, like the, the hurlers are obviously still going. They have a big game coming up against Clock Balakala and probably have re revenge on their minds. But uh, just a quick little note here, uh, Richard Hogan was on to me about uh, going on in Kilkenny at the weekend. Um, and it definitely looks like there's a potential for Dixborough to dominate in Kerry, or not in Kerry, in Kilkenny in the years to come. So they won the under-19 uh, Ryan A final. Uh, they beat James Stevens again, having beaten them, I think, at under-15 and under-17 level already. So that's under-15A, under-17A and under-19A championship victories. For Dixborough this year, so they're definitely the common side. No more than Kilcarma Kalahi are the, the common side, and Offaly definitely looks looks like Dixborough are the common side in Kilkenny. Yeah, and then it's just translating that to senior success and bringing those players through. An awful lot of players, but like, and they've had underage success before. So, at what stage is that really going to convert to, you know, to consistent um, victories at, at county level? So uh, we we'll, we we'll keep an eye on that and see. Have we most of it said for this week? Is there a couple yeah, of comments? I think I think we need to give. I think we need to give our go of the week. Yeah, we do need to give our go to the week. And I actually, I'm actually ready. It's funny. One of us is always on the back foot here. But my hurling go of the week because he he's probably never got it before, given the um the class of uh, colleagues that he shares the dressing room with. But I just thought Paddy Levy was brilliant yesterday down in Walsh Park. Does a lot of the donkey work, a lot of the maybe on scene work. Uh, and I thought Mark McMahon for Newcastle West absolutely brilliant. Just uh, a real dangerous full forward with a, a lovely left peg on him, and he was. He was one of the big differences yesterday with Newcastle West getting over the line in Limerick. I give it to Kevin Mahoney of Bally Gunner um, for his performance against Killer One. Thought he was excellent there. And you know what? I give it to Paul Finley as well. 39 years of age, scoring four points against Cross McGlenn. There's not many that do it. Nothing wrong with it now, in fairness. Not a, not a bad day's uh, work at the office, in fairness. Yeah, okay. So that's it for the show. If you want to get the audio podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash our game. Uh, just another reminder that we are brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code OURGAME and you'll get 15% off. With Richard Hogan here saying that Shane Meehan should be the go to the week. And you know what? He mightn't be too far wrong there. We might have wronged Shane Meehan, but sure, look, he'll get another opportunity in the in the Munster Junior Championship. Uh, the Celtic Tavern says, the, uh, before we go, the killer on physio is the goat of the week. A very, very busy physio too, uh, no doubt, with uh, the walking wounded in killer on. But uh, yeah, uh, another great weekend's action and can't wait to, to build up towards next weekend. And I know it's two weekends away, but I tell you, we'll get the previews in good and early 
for Napierschig against Bally Gunner as well. Yeah, and I was actually chatting to the, the Killer One physio in Boris Lee last night as well, because I had tweeted about um, about how often she was in and out of the, just kind of looking after lads throughout the game. And she goes, yeah, they're a bit soft. <laughs> so we had a good laugh about that. Okay, so that's it for the show. We'll see you again on Thursday.